I will, I will try and leave more time. I'm sorry, I, as I said I did, I went on slightly longer than I intended that time, but um, let, let, me, let me walk through the seven topics. Um, actually, what, what I'll do first is I will go through the little um, interludes in between, because um, th there's, there's all kinds of things to be said about John's Gospel, which I don't think often do get said in sermons, but, but I think it's, it's potentially quite important. John's Gospel is, of course, unique, and it, it's an amazing book. And if you read Matthew and Mark and Luke, they are terrific as well. But with John, you have a sense, oh my goodness, of being taken on a journey up a great mountain and shown this huge vista where you can see the distant ocean and other mountains and the valleys and the plains and so on. And you need to get it as a whole. I've often said to people, uh, try and read it as a whole. It, it astonishes me that many, many Christians have never sat down and read a gospel at a single sitting. You can do it with John, it'll take you about an hour and a half maybe. Well, if you were absorbed in any great book, you might well curl up with it for an hour and a half. Why not do that with John? But as I say in, in this short interlude, uh, John, as well as being a book that demands to be read like that, is also a great book to snack on. If you think, well, you can have a whole five course meal or you can dip in almost anywhere. And that's not the best way to read a book, but you can. You can say your prayers and open John's Gospel almost at random, and it will have something to say to you, which is really quite remarkable. And then another of the interludes that I do is to talk about how love works within John, because we use the word love in so many different ways. But for John, the love which God has for the world and for his people, and ultimately the love which is poured out through Jesus, takes us back into the Old Testament. And there we find the covenant love, where in Deuteronomy, God says to Israel, I've chosen you, not because you are a great and powerful nation, because you're not actually, but just because I love you. And we need to remember that when we hear the word love in John, it's not primarily our modern post-romantic 19th century ideas about love. They're all, they're all distantly related, but it's really this amazing love that God has for Israel in the Old Testament, which is then embodied dramatically in Jesus. And when it says Jesus loved his own who were in the world and he loved them to the uttermost, John 13, that's what's going on. So th there's an interlude on that between love and spirituality. And then, um, and then I talk about the messiahship of Jesus in John. It's easy to miss because John is so clear that Jesus is the personal embodiment, or if you like, incarnation of the creator God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we often skip over the notion of messiahship, but actually messiahship is hugely important in John. At the end of chapter one, you find one person saying to another, we found the Messiah and it's this man, Jesus from Nazareth. And then right at the end, at the end of John 20, these things are written that you may know that the Messiah, the son of God in that messianic sense is Jesus. And that means that messiahship carries with it all those strands of this is the one who sums up Israel in himself. And somehow Jesus for John is both the embodiment of Israel's God and the embodiment of the people Israel. And so the humanity of Jesus means that he sums up Israel. The divinity of Jesus means that he embodies the creator God. Let's go back to those original meanings. And then after the chapter on beauty, we come to um, the, the, the next interlude, which is John and the Jewish festivals. Now, many people will know this, but you may not have explored it thoroughly. That in John, Passover is enormously important because if John is about a new Genesis in the beginning, anyone who begins a Jewish book with the words in the beginning is saying, guess what, I'm writing a new Genesis here, guys, but it's also a new Exodus. It's about Passover. It's about the liberation from Egypt. It's about the notion of freedom. Guess what? And so John has Passover all the way through. Jesus chooses Passover as the day to do what has to be done. And in John's gospel, Jesus goes to his death at the moment when the Passover lambs are being sacrificed in the temple. But it isn't just Passover. You have Hanukkah, 
which is the, the time when the Jewish people to this day commemorate the cleansing of the temple by Judas Maccabeus. And in John 10, the Good Shepherd discourse is at the time of the Feast of the Dedication, which is Hanukkah, which is in December. It's, it's more or less around the same time as Christmas. Why? Because what happened with Judas Maccabeus was a cleansing of the temple after the Syrians had corrupted it, but it didn't really do the job. All who came before me, says Jesus, were thieves and robbers. The Hasmoneans who resulted from that cleansing, well, they went wrong. And the Herodians who followed them, they went even more wrong. And now when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, you have to hear that in the light of this festival and so on. We have um, the, the Feast of Booths when Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink because they pour out water at the Festival of Booths to symbolize uh, the, 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 the waters flowing from the rock in the desert. So John is saying not just Jesus happens to fulfill this one or that one or the other one, but it's a way of saying the law was given through Moses and as we read it, we see grace and truth now flowing out through Jesus Messiah. And so then, um, then I have an interlude called on reading John and listening for Jesus. And there I do what I've done in one or two little places before, but what spiritual directors have often done. And what I think you can do in a sermon or a Bible study, sometimes, maybe not always, either personally or in a small group, which is to say John's gospel lends itself to the practice of reading scripture, which goes like this. Here is a story, say Jesus in conversation with Nicodemus or with the woman of Samaria or Jesus uh, feeding the 5,000. Now, as you read that story, read it slowly and prayerfully and imagine yourself as part of that gathering. You're just on the edge of the crowd watching what's happening, wondering whether you can be part of this crowd, whether Jesus will welcome you, whether if it's with Nicodemus, whether Jesus will allow you in on this conversation and you listen to the questions Nicodemus is asking and the way that Jesus answers, not usually exactly the same question, but the question Nicodemus should have asked. John is full of things like that, of course, where Jesus answers in an oblique manner, uh, going to the real issue. And then prayerfully, you step forward and you say, excuse me, Jesus, can I have a turn? I've got this question and I would like to ask this. And if Nicodemus will let me, I'll come in on his conversation. Ask your question and wait prayerfully and see if Jesus answers you the same way he does Nicodemus. Or the other great scenes like Jesus meeting Mary at the tomb or Jesus meeting Peter by the shore. Or one of my favorites, which is when Jesus is washing the disciples' feet. And I, let me just read the, the end of this from, from the relevant bit. Read the story through till you know it well. Sense the puzzlement in the room as Jesus gets up from the table and begins to do what a servant would normally do. Listen to Peter protesting that Jesus shouldn't be doing such a thing and then changing his tone when Jesus tells him it's essential. And then Peter replies, not only my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Now, what are you going to say when he comes around to you and gently removes your sandals and begins to wash your feet? Which other bits of you need to be washed? Tell him about them and wait for his reply. Which deep griefs, fears, old sins and failed hopes will his simple action bring to light? Explain it all to him as he wipes your feet with the towel and wait while he dries your tears as well. That's how this way of reading scripture works. And as I say, one of the things I love about John's gospel is it invites that kind of reading. Slow down, take it easy, pray into the situation and see what happens. Now, some people will say, oh, that's an invitation to fantasy. You're just going to imagine this and that, and it'll all be wish fulfillment. In my experience and that of many, if you approach it prayerfully, asking for the guidance of the Holy Spirit, it needn't be fantasy. Maybe there will be a bit of that, but maybe there will be also a real sense 
of actually not so much Jesus coming into your room, though that might happen too, but you coming into his room. So then after the chapter on truth, um, there is a final interlude, which is who then is Jesus? And that's where I talk about um, the identity of Jesus in God, John's gospel as both the Messiah and the representative of Israel. So when we then go through the signposts with John in mind, one of the themes which John ought to be famous for, but usually isn't, is justice. There is a constant sense in John's gospel of a trial going on. A former colleague of mine once wrote a book called Jesus on Trial, uh, because, and it was, which is about John's gospel, because again and again, Jesus is being accused. And in this trial, he summons witnesses. My father is witness to me, or the words that I speak will give evidence, or the works that I do give evidence. There's a sense that people are accusing him, that they're accusing him of blasphemy, they're accusing him of breaking the Sabbath, they're accusing him of all sorts of things. Jesus is on trial. Read John's gospel as a great trial narrative, because think how it works out. Who is the ultimate accuser? The word in Hebrew for the accuser is the Satan. And at the climax of John's gospel, the Satan enters into Judas, not just meaning he's demon possessed, but Judas now is doing the ultimate accusing. He is the one through whom Jesus gets handed over for a public trial. And so we see the trial, we watch as Pilate interrogates Jesus and says, aren't you going to make any answer to the charges against you and so on. And as Jesus explains to puzzle Pilate about kingdom and truth and power. And then we watch with horror as justice is denied, trampled on. And Jesus, who we've known all along to be innocent, whose works have testified on his behalf, whose father has testified on his behalf, nevertheless, he goes to his death. But part of the point of the Johannine resurrection narrative is that this is how God is putting not only Jesus in the right, but the world in the right. That Jesus has gone to his death with the destiny of Israel on his shoulders and on Israel's shoulders is the destiny of the world. And Jesus takes that to the point where the signpost of justice is broken and ruined. And then, having done that, comes out the other side into new life, which says a new world is born and it's a world in which everything is put right, in which Mary's tears are to be dried, in which Thomas's doubts are to be laid to rest, in which Peter's shame is redeemed by being recommissioned to be the shepherd for the sheep. So the great theme of justice is woven closely into John. And when you read this chapter, you'll see how that actually works. And then of course, easy one, this, the theme of love is, as I said, absolutely endemic in John's gospel. If people know no other verses from Sunday school, they sure as anything know John 16. I've often told the story of one time when I was arriving to do some lectures in America and the guy at the customs, he said, so what's your job then? So I said, well, I'm a bishop actually, showing him my passport, he said, Reverend lent you. I said, oh, bishop, are you? He said, what's John 3.16 say? This was his way of testing whether I was real. So thinking quickly on my feet and being a bit um, punch drunk with the flight and all that, I said, Hutos gare gabasen hotheos ton cosmon, God so loved the world, and I quoted the whole verse, John 3.16, in Greek, and he stared at me and I said, well, you asked me what John 3.16 said. So he laughed and he la I might have been put in jail for that, but fortunately he let me through. John 3.16, though, sums up the quintessence of John's gospel. God so loved the world. But the odd thing is, as in the prologue, Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive him. He came to the world which was his own creation and the world didn't know him. But, but, but as many as received him and you know the rest. And so there is this extraordinary story about Jesus embodying the rich outpoured love of God and as we watch the story unfold, we ought to be saying, well, they ought to be thrilled. They ought to be delighted that here at last, this is what it looks like 
when the creator's love goes to work. But we see in John's gospel, some people celebrating and a lot of people saying, huh, we don't want that here, thanks very much. He, he breaks the Sabbath. He calls God his father. How can this be? And Jesus challenges them. And one of the scary things about John's gospel is so those middle chapters, seven, eight, and nine, when I was writing my little commentary on John's gospel, John for Everyone, I was quite nervous when I got to those chapters because they are so dark, because this is what happens when love is spurned, when God does the, his uttermost and the people to whom he's come say, not for us, thank you, we've got a better idea. So I chase that through in this chapter, through in the whole sequence, where, as I quoted before, and it bears repetition again, John 13, verse 1, the introduction to the second half of the gospel, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the uttermost. And the word love then comes up in the farewell discourses, love one another. In other words, John is saying, and Jesus is saying, this is all about God's love for the world, and that will be manifest to the world if you love one another. And my friends, this is still the mandate for Christian unity. And we have done so much in terms of planting different churches and developing our own ministries, etc., that we easily forget that the purpose of the church is to be a single body who by our love for one another, which is just as costly as God's love for us, by our love for one another, the world will see that this is the way, the truth and the life, not something else. So the problem about love in, in St. John's gospel again, is that Jesus ends up being betrayed, denied and crucified. And so again, the resurrection says, yes, but now this is how love wins the victory. And somehow as we read John's gospel, we discern woven into the narrative, not thrown at us in dogmatic pronouncements, though there are a few of those in John too, but woven into the narrative, Jesus going to the cross is doing what love had to do, knowing that he was taking the hatred, the anger of the world onto himself and exhausting it so that the resurrection narratives say, this is how love wins the victory. So then spirituality and John's gospel, of course, is full of this amazing temple theology, as I think I said before, where uh, we, we discern the word became flesh and tabernacled in our midst. Well, that word eskenosen, he pitched his tent in our midst. This takes us back to the book of Exodus. This is why I said John's gospel is obviously a new Genesis. That's how it starts but it folds the story of the Exodus into itself. It's a Passover story, but the point of Passover is not just this frees the people from Egypt in order to give them the law, but they are freed and given the law in order to be the tabernacle bearing people. The people of Israel are the people in whose midst God comes to dwell against the day when he will do this for real in person. The tabernacle is an advance prophecy of the incarnation and the gift of the spirit and then the temple in jerusalem which does the same thing again is likewise a forward pointer to the time when the earth shall be full of the glory of the lord as the waters cover the sea i've explored this a lot in chapter five of my book history and eschatology but i've explored it in this book in relation to john because for john the temple is paramount chapter two you get the cleansing of the temple not at the end as in matthew mark and towards the end as in matthew mark and luke and all the way through jesus keeps going to jerusalem and he keeps on upstaging the temple. If you want forgiveness, don't go to the temple, go to Jesus. If you want healing, you'll get it out here on the street from Jesus. Jesus is embodying what the temple was symbolizing, namely, this is where heaven and earth come together. That's perhaps clearer in John than any other place in the New Testament, though it is in the New Testament throughout. I fear that many of us were brought up to read John in a very individualistic way. Well, that's fine. We've all got to start somewhere. But that plays into some dodgy themes in our culture where it's just me and my spirituality and that's all that matters. And as, as long as I get to heaven, well, maybe I'll bring one or two people with me. But here's the thing, and it's so clear in John, 
that the biblical story is not about how saved souls go to heaven. It's all about how God the creator longs to dwell with his people in the new heavens and the new earth. That when God makes the new creation, God comes to dwell in the midst. The word became flesh and tabernacled in our midst. And then receive the Holy Spirit as the Father sent me, so I send you. And this is not just a temporary thing while this earth throws it away in the trash can. I had a terrifying email from an American friend today who said he'd heard a sermon which somebody had preached, which in which the person said that God made this present world as a bit of disposable junk, which he's going to throw away because we're going somewhere else. That is terrifying because it's so deeply anti-biblical. It's anti the whole Old Testament for a start. It's opposed to the first article of the creed, which says that I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. God didn't make junk. He didn't ask us to live on junk. And John's gospel throbs with the kind of spirituality which says, this is where heaven and earth come together. And Jesus stands dangerously at that intersection point and gives us his spirit so that we can stand there too. And that is the very heart of a biblical spirituality. And of course, Jesus going to his death and Jesus in agonies. In the other gospel, it comes out in Gethsemane, but in John's gospel, it comes out in chapter 12. Jesus says, now is my soul troubled and what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? No, this was why I came for this hour. And then there is a thunderclap as God says, I have glorified my name and I will glorify it again, because Jesus has said, Father, glorify your name. And with that, we see the tension in the spirituality of the Gospels, that following Jesus, living at the intersection between heaven and earth is costly. It costs Jesus. And as we see at the end of the Gospel, it costs Peter as well. But that's how John explores the world where heaven and earth come together. Jesus himself is the true temple, and he calls us by the equipment of the Spirit to be temple people. And then with beauty, I thought when I got to that point, maybe I'm pushing my luck here, but then I reread John's Gospel and I thought, I feel beauty coming out of this all the way through. And of course, good writers, if you go to a, a creative writing course, or if you look at books on how to write, um, the good novelist, the good poet, the good dramatist doesn't say it was really beautiful. They show you the beauty and then evoke from you the sense, wow, that's beautiful. And that's what John does. And actually, the word for beauty in either Hebrew or Greek is pretty rare in the Bible. If you look it up in the concordance, but as I say, and following on from the temple theme, if you imagine for a moment that you have come out of Egypt with the children of Israel, with Moses, and you're in the dry and dusty desert, relying on manna to eat and water from the rock if you're lucky, and it's all very hard work and, 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 and so on, and then God gives Moses this amazing blueprint for constructing the tabernacle, and think of the jewels and the colors and the designs and so on. And, you know, people used to say in the medieval world of Europe, uh, when they built a cathedral, it was the only beautiful building that people had ever seen. And people living in their hovels and their mud huts would see this amazing construction. And it was like heaven on earth. And that was the point. It was a sign of God's desire to build heaven on earth. And you get to share in it. John's Gospel, my friends, is that kind of a book. It's meant for you to say, wow, this is extraordinary. My, my granddaughter last night was taken to a service in one of the Oxford College chapels. She'd been in that building before, but never after dark. And it was the evening and there were candles lit and so on. And I wasn't there. I, I had to stay home for actually for another podcast or webinar or something. I can't remember. But my wife took her in. And this little girl, little eight-year-old girl, went into this chapel and uh, suddenly Maggie realized she wasn't following her in because this little girl had just stood there and said, wow, it was so beautiful. That's the reaction 
that a wise reader of John would have. And again, I keep coming back to it, I know, but the farewell discourses have that sense of mystery, of beauty, that here we are in the tabernacle. It's beauty, it's shining, it's shimmering. We're here with Jesus, hanging on his every word. And then after the darkness of the crucifixion, again, Easter morning, very early in the morning, while it was yet dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. And like the bit I read to you before about the moon with the two planets, there is something of that mood in the way that John tells that matchless story of Easter morning, and then the subsequent one in chapter 21 of Breakfast by the Shore. So I want to say John has woven beauty into his narrative because it's all about creation and new creation. And that's what the story of Jesus and the resurrection is all about. But then with freedom, as I said, well, if John has taken the Passover as one of his major themes, which he obviously has, then it's obvious that his gospel is all about freedom. Well, isn't it? And the Jews knew perfectly well. Freedom was what you got at Passover. So every year, the Roman governor would come up to Jerusalem in case there was a riot, because often there was. Because when you're celebrating freedom a thousand years before, 1500 years before, then you jolly well want freedom now. And they knew that they were under the cosh of the Roman overlords. And the Romans weren't as bad as the Syrians, as the Egyptians, as the Babylonians had been, but the Romans were pretty brutal. And anyway, the Jews with their tradition of freedom and knowing that actually their God was supposed to be the king of the world, why on earth would they want to be ruled by anybody else or pay taxes to Caesar for goodness sake? So these issues are on the table. And John's gospel comes right in there into the midst and has Jesus going to Jerusalem at Passover time and cleansing the temple, which is the acted symbol of the fact that this system isn't the way to true freedom, but Jesus is offering the way to true freedom. And then you get those discourses about freedom that I referred to before. If the sun sets you free, you will be really free really free. And there's an extraordinary moment when the Judeans say, we've never been enslaved to anyone. We have Abraham as our father. And you think, whoa, hang on. If you know the Abraham story, you surely know that Abraham's family went into slavery in Egypt for hundreds of years, and the Passover brought them out. And then what's more, read the book of Judges. You've never been enslaved to anyone. Give us a break. Or read then particularly the horrible story of the Assyrian invasion, and then, of course, the Babylonian exile and then read Ezra and Nehemiah and discover, even after they come back from the exile in Babylon, they say things like, we are in our own land, but we are still slaves. And that is the paradox and the puzzle of what we call post-exilic Israel, post-exilic Judaism, because by then it is only the Jewish people, because most of the tribes of Israel have been exiled and lost long before at the time of the Assyrian invasion in the 8th century BC. And so the puzzle of Second Temple Judaism from the time of Ezra and Nehemiah on through the time of Jesus is the puzzle of we are supposed to be God's free people, but it doesn't seem to have worked out like that, which is exactly the puzzle that so many people in our world feel today. They know that we are meant for freedom. They want their families to be brought up in freedom. They want their society, their kindred, their, their, their traditions to be able to flourish. And they find themselves squashed again and again. And John's gospel tells the story of how Jesus' freedom dream ends up on the cross. In other words, John's story of Jesus is of the broken signpost of freedom in order that then by reading that story, the watching world, the listening world will say, oh my, supposing the God who made the world came and shared our broken dreams, came to stand, to be hung up on a cross at the point where the broken signpost of freedom is only too obvious. What would that mean? And back to the apologetic, if it isn't apologetic, purpose of this book. It's a way of saying these were the right questions to ask. Justice, spirituality, relationships, beauty, freedom. These were the right issues to be concentrating on. 
the world is not a sick joke. It's not a matter of these being merely impulses which we have, which we ought to have grown out of now. These are true, but the truth is revealed in Jesus. And then when Jesus rises from the dead, I'm telling the story again and again, when Jesus rises from the dead, we say, now we see what true freedom means. It means having Jesus' breath in your lungs that by the Spirit you can be free people, but free now with the Jesus-shaped commission to be for the world what Jesus was for Israel. As the Father sent me, so I send you. And so then to truth, one of the most famous lines in the gospel, when Jesus is asked by Pilate about his kingdom. And again, as usual, Jesus answers the other question, the one Pilate didn't quite ask. Pilate says, are you a king? And Jesus says, I came into the world to tell the truth. <laughs> so hang on, what's that about? Well, we'll come to that in a minute. And Pilate says, what is truth? Or in my translation, truth, snorted Pilate. What's that? Because Pilate, like certain politicians very well known to you and me, has decided that he will make his own truth. Thank you very much. All empires do this. They say, the world isn't quite how we want it to be, so we will get in there. We British did this, by the way, throughout the 19th century. If the bit of the world wasn't the way we wanted it to be, we sent in a few gunboats and we uh, made our own truth. Didn't work in all cases, shall we say, but we'll draw a veil over that. But this is how empires, certainly how the Romans worked. We will tell you what the truth is, and if your world doesn't fit, we will cut it and shape it so that it does fit. Truth is what we make it. And this, of course, is exactly what the postmodernists, postmodernists from Friedrich Nietzsche 120 years ago through to our own day have been saying. Truth is simply something which power can manipulate. Truth is what the powerful claim in order to enslave the powerless. And so we've had this great battle about truth and truthfulness, which I mentioned before. And at this point, the notion of truth coming through in the gospel, very interesting about the truth of the gospel in Galatians. What is the truth of the gospel? The truth of the gospel in Galatians, this is in square brackets, but my goodness, it's important, especially granted some of the things that are going on in our world right now. The truth of the gospel in Galatians is that because on the cross, Jesus Christ has defeated all the principalities and powers, all the forces of evil, therefore pagans who used to be idol worshippers, if they come to be baptized and believing members of Jesus' family, they are pagans no longer. In other words, the truth of the gospel is that because of Jesus' saving death on our behalf, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, no male and female. You are all one in Messiah Jesus. My friends, if the Western church had taken that seriously these last 400 years, we would have set an example to the world that would have not allowed the way things now are to come about. That is all, as I say, in square brackets, but I think it's quite important. But in John's gospel, what we see is Jesus talking about truth telling and we realize gradually, I think, that truth is a function of new creation. The truth of the old creation looks as if it's broken. That's why post-modernity goes with the broken signposts and says, oh, it's all a waste of time. It's all people's power games. It's all people's fake news, whatever it is. But Jesus is there to inaugurate new creation. And the point about new creation is that it's not a replacement. It isn't God saying, forget the old creation, I'm doing something totally different. It's God remaking creation from the womb of the old. Romans 8, the world is, is, is groaning in travail, waiting for the redemption of creation within which the redemption of our bodies will happen. And 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul talks about the abolition of death itself, then creation will be free to be itself. And when Jesus is talking about telling the truth, he's talking about speaking new creation. And even, dare I say, speaking new creation into birth. Jesus, having made the world by his word of power, is now making the new creation 
and inviting us to belong to it and by his spirit to become truth tellers ourselves. So we see Pilate's cynicism at the climax of the gospel and then with the resurrection. Jesus doesn't need to say it, but we ought to know that this is the point which proves the claim in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What does that look like? Read John 20 and 21. This is the truth of God's new world, and by the Spirit we are called to be people who tell the truth and thereby bring about elements of God's new creation against the day when that will be complete. And finally, power. And I'm just going to say two words about this and then shut up. Because <clears throat> John's gospel, of course, is all about power because it's all about God and Jesus and the kingdom of God. But we discover gloriously in John's gospel that power lies in the gift of love, which enables things to happen, i.e. new creation the redemption from the old for the new, the forgiveness of sins, the, the, the outpouring of new life, so that whether it's Nicodemus or whether it's the woman of Samaria or whether it's the man born blind or whoever, we see again and again God's power unleashed to transform human lives. And if you know your biblical theology, the world gets transformed by transformed and transforming people as God calls human beings to be his agents, his responsible creatures in taking forward his work of new creation. That is what so much of John's gospel is about. There, there are a thousand more things I could say. I've done a little flip through this book and I hope you enjoy reading it if you can, but it is now time for me to shut up again. And it's nearly time for my supper, but there is time for you to ask some questions before we get there.